hope. There is no truth with a capital T. There is no even external objects. There is no chair. There is just complete loss. There is darkness and there is blind searching out and just not being able to feel or find anything. My name is Michael. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. Um, I've been saved a little over a year, about a year and a week and a half. I was saved on campus, actually at the University of Missouri here. Um, there was an evangelistic outreach um, from a group in Kirksville. Winding backwards, there are a lot of threads that, as I've walked with the Lord, I realize more and more how great a tapestry it was. Um, starting back a little over, probably about 10 years ago, when I was about 13, 14, um, I remember I sat in my bed, because I was raised in a, in a house where God existed, but there was no real Christ, there was no real um, religion, it was just God exists, and if you're good, then you'll probably get something at the end of it. Um, but I remember hearing something about maybe God doesn't exist, God doesn't do all these really remarkable things anymore. So I sat in my bed, and I said to myself, well, God doesn't exist. And I pulled the covers over my head, and I wasn't immediately struck down with a lightning bolt. And so from then on, it was sort of, well, maybe God doesn't exist. And it seemed to be, at the time, very freeing in terms of now I could do anything. You know, uh, I think it was Nietzsche who said that if God is dead, then all, things, all acts are permissible. So everything suddenly became open to me, and I started looking for anything and everything that could explain anything. Um, starting with the premise that God doesn't exist. And so over the years, I sort of had this thorn in the back of my mind, and I went to a Lutheran church. I asked a woman to be my godmother. That really came to nothing. I had no uh, drive or unction to read the Bible, to attend the church. Um, and so having all of that fail, I started really getting into philosophy. Um, I started really reading guys, you know, like... Uh, Descartes, Nietzsche, um, Freud, uh, the newer atheist guys later on like Dawkins and Dennett and all of these guys and basically searching and scrambling for absolutely anything that seemed like truth to me. It didn't necessarily matter if it was provable outside of myself, uh, just that it seemed right. Um, I mean, there's, uh, there's a, it says in scripture that there's a way that seems right to a man but its end is death. Um, and it really sunk me down low. Um, there was no real value to any of it. Um, I've still got the scars very faintly on my arm that uh, testify to how low I got um, in just depression and all of these other things, and I just tried to seek absolutely anything else. And so I tried to become this intellectual, try to go through men to find the reason for everything since men are all that we have. Um, and so to that end, I started studying at the university philosophy and getting really into um, all of these theories about how you can't, going from Descartes, you can't prove anything outside of yourself, outside of your own mind. Um, as I've said to people before, I could really earnestly make you believe, at least entertain the idea that the chair I'm sitting in doesn't exist, that the house I'm in right now isn't real. You know, it's like Morpheus said in that, in that movie, you know, what are experiences outside of electrical signals interpreted by our brain? Mm -hmm. And if you go to the logical conclusion of that, really they're nothing, which means that we are nothing, which means that everything is inconsequential. So what's the point? You know, and it, that just sort of stuck, and I started being okay with that. Um, but as I started studying more and more, I took a class uh, probably year and a half to two years ago now on the varieties of religious experience because it seemed to me that regardless of my lack of faith um, there was something still valuable about faith um, there was still that thorn that said that there was something amiss um, and so in the varieties of religious experience class I really got a sense of a faith in faith and I valued people who had faith because it seemed like there was something else. I didn't know what. I was just looking for it in men. So the it became what I was looking for in terms of truth, lowercase t. Um, and so through seeking that in this class, 
um, and through reading uh, one of Richard Dawkins' books, actually, a uh, strident militant atheist leading me to consider the things of God is pretty glorious. Um, he considered it a perceptual burqa, which is essentially what he means by that is that when you have a burqa, you have a very small window of perception, and there's so much else. And the everything else that humans can't possibly perceive was an idea that really stuck with me. Um, I really started considering what that could mean, what, if, it was these, if these religious experiences that I was learning about had anything to do with that, if there was any reality to them. A lot of them just seemed like, you know, they, they could just be anything that anybody happened to experience on a cold day, and it was just, okay, whatever. But there was something in the very core of it that seemed to resonate. It was something was more real than electrical signals. And so I just started thinking about that, thinking about those things, and I decided, okay, well, maybe there is something beyond human capacity. Very broad thought, but that was four days before that Kirksville Evangelical Outreach, um, where I was sitting and mocking a, uh, I'll be honest card, about uh, how you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I was sitting with two friends of mine, we were talking about how ludicrous that is, since you know, truth can't exist outside of a uh, perception, and the perception is based on faulty whatever. Um, and we were just laughing about this, and a girl from Columbia came up and talked to me and just asked, can I, can I ask what you guys are, are talking about? Obviously she knew what we were talking about, but it was that conversation that really led to um, just me thinking about more and more the things outside of myself. Uh, after about an hour, my two friends left the conversation, tried to pull me away, and but there was something different about this person. There was something real, something that really struck me about this person. I couldn't put my finger on it, but um, I really wanted to continue talking to her, and so I continued talking to her for about two hours, I think, after that. So it was about a three-hour conversation at Speaker Circle. Um, and then we parted ways. Um, I think she was sort of pulled away because I guess a lot of people there are kind of used to talking to atheists and are sort of hesitant to follow up on that because there's a lot of just animosity. Um, I mean, I started mocking them. was how the conversation started. So it became very clear that what she believed, she believed so much more than anything that I believed that she had to have some, some kind of truth that I was just not privy to at all. I had no idea what she was referring to, what she was pulling these arguments out of, because I was trying to get at her at any sort of argument that I could about morality questions, about really sort of painful questions about like abortion and all of these other things like murder and rape and all of these things. And really what struck me was that every single re response that she gave was essentially the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good news of his coming and his dying and the reality of sin, and that's all that she would say. There was no argumentation, there was discussion about what I was bringing up, but the argument was, essentially, this doesn't really matter. What matters is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm -hmm. And she kept nailing that home over and over again. And by the time we split, it was there was a real drive to want to read the Bible, to see what she was talking about, if any of it was true. Um, and so I started asking around, you know, what, what types of Bible do you guys read? There was a bunch of translations. I'd heard all of these arguments about how we can't trust all these different translations because they've been translated so many times from so many different people. Um, but after a little while, there was a Bible that just sort of showed up. Uh, this friend of mine who came to Kirksville, uh, was talking about me. Apparently she had brought me up for prayer. Um, someone from the church had an extra Bible that they'd happened to bring one day. Um, they just sort of said, oh, well, I already have one, but I'll bring this one just in case. It was a little small, tiny little guy. And uh, this friend of hers gave it to her to give to me, and I started reading it. And I started with John, um, and I started just really considering the things of God and wondering what was actually happening to the world, essentially. Um, and I continued talking to uh, this friend of mine who met me on campus and um, through a lot of these conversations about all of these things that I wanted to talk about, she just kept pointing me to the gospel, pointing me to the gospel and eventually it just broke down to, I need to let go. 
-hmm. of all of these things that I'm starting with because I was starting from the position that God didn't exist. And so adding anything to that, if it sort of contradicted any of my previous premises, clearly some, something new had to be wrong. Mm -hmm. But I was unwilling to accept that God could exist. And so, um, you know, I was reading things on... Uh, like uh, uh, there was an article by Horatius Bonar about letting go and falling into the hands of God um, that was instrumental. Um, I was reading about uh, the Lord's work in people in Africa who had never heard the gospel, and he's saving these people. I was hearing about um, all of these amazing works that the Lord has done, all the while thinking that, okay, even if the Lord is real, then I must be reprobate, because I, you know, he didn't care. I said that he didn't exist. I didn't believe. So, and nothing had happened to me. So clearly he just wasn't paying attention and wasn't going to do anything for me. But uh, through reading the scriptures, through talking with this girl, through eventually just hearing her say, you need, just need to believe. You can do all of these things. You can try to figure out your own way, your way to salvation. But essentially what you need to do is just believe. You don't need to work yourself up. You can't work yourself up to a perfect righteousness because I've already sinned. You can't work your way to being heard by God because you've already sinned. You've already fallen short. And, you know, it It suddenly started to make sense. Yeah, okay, if all of this is true, what well, she's telling me, it's, co it's consistent with what the Bible is saying. So, I was sitting in my basement at the time, and I just decided, okay, well, I'll pray. I'll start praying just talking to the Lord and asking. I didn't know who I was I was talking to at first, but I started just talking. And the first few times, it didn't really seem like anything was happening, nothing was really going on. Um, but I had told her that I had prayed. And she said, well, do it again and keep calling out. Keep knocking because the door will be opened. I didn't know what that meant at the time. But she just said, keep praying. And so I did. I prayed over and over again. And eventually it started to seem like something else was happening. I was no longer talking to my ceiling. I wasn't having my voice bounce off of walls. I was being heard. Someone was listening. Someone was understanding. And I was able to just pour out all of these things that had been going on. My animosity towards the idea of God because nothing happened to me when I was trying to prove that He existed or didn't exist, as things may be. Nothing had happened. So clearly He wasn't there. I was really angry with Him. you know. But who was I angry with? I, w I just kept asking him, if I could be saved, please let's let me know. And I started just, okay, I'll test it. I'll say, I'll believe. I will believe just to see if anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I tried to really clear out and scientifically test it, get away all of the other variables and just say, okay, the one variable that needs to be changed is I need to believe. So I started acting like I believed and I prayed like I believed. And it wasn't like a, a play acting type thing. It was really putting myself in the position to believe. And the more I did that, the Lord provided very little, very a few crumbs, but enough for me to go, this is more than anything that I could have thought of. And my faith just grew by leaps and bounds in those few days until the point where I really, uh, <laughs> I believed that I believed, but I didn't really believe. You know, it, it was about a week long period where I sort of believed that I believed I was going through these things. And uh, one day I work, I work night stock, so I stock shelves all night, and I was driving home one day, um, and I was stopped at a stop sign, and the sun was coming up in the morning, and um, there was these clouds in the sky, and the sky was really orange and all of these things, and it was just sort of a normal day, normal sunrise for the most part, but I started to, I was thinking on the things of God, thinking about Christ, and suddenly, I mean, I couldn't have told you at the time, but John 3.16 3, suddenly became real and became about me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, that became, for God so loved Michael, mm -hmm. that he gave his only begotten son, that if I were to believe on him, I would not perish, but would have eternal life. And so that hit me as real, not just as an idea, like I've read it, but it hit me as a reality. And I'm looking at this sunrise, and suddenly it pops it becomes this Van Gogh painting, and all of these rivets in the, in the paint start to become more real. And as this happens, I start to realize my sin. If Christ is real, if Christ has died for me, how wretched am I? What have I done to deserve this? There is nothing that I could possibly do 
that could bring me to him, and yet he still has died. If he is real, and I am, in, and I am real, I mean, truth with a st capital T started to come in. If, if he is real, if he has died, and I am this wretched, what can I possibly do? What can really be real? And suddenly it all started to pour on me. My, I just started to get huge conviction, like, what could I possibly have been doing with my entire life mm -hmm. that I could put such just insult, insult to the creator of the universe mm -hmm. and the reality of Christ, the reality of my sin, the, the, the brevity of life, all of that, the, the beauty of all of creation that was testifying mm -hmm. to God, all of it hit me at once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are so many people that have different so many different testimonies in that in that regard when all of that happens in stages but all of that hit me at once like a brick in the head mm -hmm. and I just started I, I broke down at my sin and I was laughing at my at, at Christ and just overjoyed that Christ was a reality but I was weeping at the same time that I had sinned against him I was crying and weeping and laughing and doing all of these things this huge mess of emotion on my drive home for the rest of the time and I just started, when I got home, I was calling out to the Lord, thanking Him for Jesus Christ. And just tables and chairs, suddenly I wasn't doubting their existence anymore. I was just so overjoyed that there was something outside of myself, some bedrock. you know. And when I got the reality of judgment, you know, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. I was just so, I was, I was afraid, but it wasn't a fear that I, you know, I was going to fall off of a high building or something like that. It was, it was a reality of who he is. He had revealed himself to me a lot. I mean, I related so much to Saul when he was uh, condoning, I guess, the stoning of Stephen and when his garments were thrown at his feet. He was condoning it. He was endorsing it. He approved of it. He wanted it to happen, and then he, on his, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute more Christians. That's what I was doing on campus. As an atheist, I was sitting at Speaker Circle, talking to these people, yelling at these people, calling them fools. And Scripture says over and over again, the fool says in his heart, God doesn't exist. And it's, I mean, it, just how much hypocrisy there was. And when the scales fell off of my eyes, just so much glory was just poured in just the reality that all of these things were made through Christ for Christ by God through him for him all things are from him and to him and through him I mean so much just opened up the reality of the world suddenly just hit me and all of these philosophies of men all of these things that I'd been dedicating myself to I've been spending so much time on in computer games spending so much time playing tabletop games like uh, like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff just silly things just wasting time just so that uh, until basically I was dead because there was no point to life mm. you know it, all of it hit me in just this huge wide swath of glory of, of the Lord and just what he is and who he is and what he's done his perfect completed work on Calvary just how much the Lord has worked from the beginning of time to bring us back to himself it's 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 something that just I can't I still can't fully grasp it, the the grace of it. It is truly by grace. If I had any choice in the matter, I really would have just continued to run into hell with my hands over my ears and my eyes closed, screaming, and slam the door behind me, because I had no reality whatsoever. But through the grace of God, He set it up that this. This outreach happened. My heart had been changed the four days beforehand. Just so many things happened step by step, like a domino effect, that I I could not deny it. I could not. When my when the scales came off, it was like it was seeing for the first time. And you know, there's a, a classic philosophical dilemma of it's called the Mary problem. You can know absolutely everything there is to know about the color red, say, and then but in a completely black and white world. If she were to then leave that world and see the color red, say in a hallway leaving a door, see the color red, does she learn anything? Well, clearly she does. She has that experience of a reality, of a new, a, an entirely new reality, something that, that she couldn't have possibly imagined before. 
And when your eyes are open, suddenly you can see that, yes, there is something moving. There is a reality. We are marching off of a cliff into hell. Mm -hmm. And, but yet the Lord says, call and I will answer. Knock and the door will be opened. Mm -hmm. And it was through the grace of God that I was even able to see that. And yet, and through hearing the gospel, the power of God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it, I, I just had this curiosity. And I was led to read, and I was led to see more and more, and it was truly the work of God that, that opened my eyes to see just truth. You know, there was, I thought for a long, long time that religion was adding something to a checklist. I'm a, I'm a Christian, so I'm, I'm good. You know, I, I go to church even on Sundays. But the call, to, the call for Christianity, the call that Christ gives to those who would be His disciples is forsake everything. It's come and follow me, and he demands perfection. And clearly no human being has ever been perfect unless they are also God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There is none who does good, no, not one. And without Jesus Christ, there is no hope. There is no truth with a capital T. There is no even external objects. There is no chair. There is just complete loss. There is darkness, and there is blind searching out and just not being able to feel or find anything. And that really is the lost person in general. It is, it is the state of everyone outside of Christ. And so really the only way to find anything is through Christ, as all things are made in Him and through Him and by Him. And so I guess the, the exhortation really that I would have is to just let go of that rope of the sinking ship and just see that you that Christ is there that there is a reality in Christ and that he will not forsake those who truly seek him in his means there are so many false gospels so many things that are just clean yourself up repent of your repent of your sins because you're doing horrible things and that's it it's repent and turn towards Jesus Christ because he is faithful to save and that's just that's been the story of of my life over the last years as as things have gone wrong as I've turned away from him it's always been horrible and wrong and it just is these things that lead to death and Christ while I'm faithless he is faithful to redeem and to save and to bring us back to himself and so amen, amen.